In this screencast, we'll discuss the use of advanced diagnostic imaging in pregnant patients. At the end of this screencast, you should be able to describe proper pregnancy screening prior to the use of advanced imaging and the proper consent for imaging in pregnant women. You should be able to differentiate the different imaging modalities based on whether they use ionizing radiation or do not. And you should be able to describe the common scenarios for using advanced imaging in pregnant patients. Prior to performing a diagnostic study in a woman, we will often screen for pregnancy. Patients of reproductive age or menstrual age will often fill out a standardized form and or undergo direct questioning to determine if there is a potential pregnancy. In patients with direct ionizing radiation to the pelvis, we often require a pregnancy test within 72 hours of performing the diagnostic procedure. If pregnancy screening is positive, it is recommended that the referring physician or ordering physician notify the patient of their pregnancy status. Non-ionizing radiation modalities should be considered if they can provide similar information. And then prior to doing any diagnostic imaging procedure, it is recommended that informed consent be obtained from the pregnant woman. Obtaining informed consent provides an opportunity to educate our patients. There are increasing news stories and an increasing awareness about the risks related to radiation. Most of the diagnostic imaging that we're going to perform in pregnant women has minimal risk, and we can use the informed consent process to reassure and reduce the anxiety of patients. We want to make sure that they do understand there is a small risk, but that we believe that small risk is outweighed by the benefits of diagnostic imaging. At our institution, we will obtain informed consent from pregnant women prior to all x-ray, fluoroscopy, CT, or nuclear medicine exams. And typically that informed consent is obtained by the radiology resident or attending. Although MRI does not use ionizing radiation, we also do get informed consent prior to an MRI in pregnant women. And again, it is mostly an opportunity to educate the patient about the imaging modality and reassure the patient of minimal risk. A pregnancy test is required before obtaining which of the following diagnostic imaging studies? A pelvic CT administers ionizing radiation directly to the region of the fetus and therefore would require a pregnancy test. What is the goal of obtaining informed consent prior to diagnostic imaging in pregnant women? We obtain informed consent to reduce the patient's anxiety. We don't want to de-emphasize the risk. We don't want to emphasize the risk. We don't want to make the patient more worried. We want to be very straightforward and tell them that there is minimal risk associated with ionizing radiation, but that the benefits of a, the diagnostic imaging study outweigh the risk. When we think about the different basic modalities that we use in radiology, there are modalities that require ionizing radiation and modalities that don't require ionizing radiation. X-rays, CTs, nuclear medicine studies, and PET all have ionizing radiation to varying degrees depending on the study. Ultrasound and MRI do not require ionizing radiation and are therefore felt to be safer and are preferred modalities when imaging pregnant women. Ultrasound is the preferred imaging modality in pregnant women. There's no ionizing radiation, and ultrasound does a good job looking at the liver and gallbladder or bile ducts, a good job at looking at the urinary system, kidneys and bladder, and a good job imaging the pelvis. There's minimal theoretical risk associated with ultrasound. There's no ionizing radiation. Ultrasound can induce some degree of heating or mechanical injury, but that is very unlikely. Doppler ultrasound does have 
slightly increased heating or risk of mechanical injury, and because of that, we don't use Doppler ultrasound in the first trimester of pregnancy when the fetus is small and undeveloped. MRI imaging is the second line modality that we will use in pregnant women. There's no ionizing radiation, and again, there is some minimal theoretical risk. So MRI can result in tissue heating, and also the MRI machine is extremely loud and could theoretically damage the developing hearing of the fetus, but there are no documented cases of harm. The disadvantages of MRI compared to ultrasound are that it's very expensive. It requires expert interpretation. It's not as available as ultrasound, and oftentimes people become claustrophobic. So an MRI takes 30 minutes up to an hour, and you have to be inside a very thin tube, and that can make it challenging for certain patients who don't like to be in tight spaces. We can use a type of IV contrast for MRI called gadolinium contrast, but it is contraindicated in pregnancy. Magnetic resonance imaging is a very robust tool and it can be used to image almost any part of the body with a high sensitivity and specificity. So if ultrasound isn't going to answer your clinical question and you need diagnostic imaging in a pregnant woman, MRI is often an excellent modality for determining what's going on in your patient. Radiographs, more commonly known as x-rays, do require ionizing radiation. When an x-ray is obtained outside of the abdomen or pelvis, there's minimal fetal dose and x-rays can be used for routine clinical indications. So getting a chest x-ray in a person with suspected pneumonia or shortness of breath, or getting a radiograph of an extremity in a patient who has a suspected fracture. Mammography is a type of x-ray and poses minimal risk to the fetus and can be obtained without concern for fetal dose. Abdomen and pelvis radiographs or lumbar spine radiographs should be avoided. They cause direct ionizing radiation to the feet developing fetus and usually alternative imaging modalities such as ultrasound or MRI are going to better answer your question anyway. So in pregnant women, I recommend you avoid radiographs of the abdomen, pelvis, or lumbar spine. Computed tomography, also known as CT, requires ionizing radiation at a dose higher than that used for radiographs. When performing CT outside of the abdomen and pelvis, there is minimal risk from the fetal exposure. Head and neck CT is a good study for evaluating patients with trauma, infection, or suspected intracranial hemorrhage. Extremity CTs can be performed in the setting of trauma or infection with minimal risk to the patient. When patients have acute shortness of breath in pregnancy and a pulmonary embolus is suspected, a chest CT PE protocol is preferred over a VQ scan due to the lower dose to the fetus. In all of these examples, the minimal or low risk of fetal exposure to ionizing radiation is outweighed by the benefit of detecting a life-threatening pathologic process. CTs of the abdomen, pelvis, or lumbar spine are felt to be a higher risk than CTs of the head and neck, chest, or extremities. That's because there is direct ionizing radiation exposure to the developing fetus. We have developed newer techniques to try to reduce the dose to the fetus and reduce the overall dose, but the dose is still higher when imaging the abdomen, pelvis, or lumbar spine. The most common time to use abdomen and pelvis CT in a pregnant woman is in the setting of trauma. You may also find patients who are pregnant who have an acute abdomen and are unstable, and therefore a CT is the fastest modality to image an unstable patient. Lumbar spine 
and bony pelvis CT is of moderate risk because it's often a high dose CT and it's rarely indicated because there are typically alternative modalities such as MRI that can provide you with similar information. In the setting of trauma, you can often reconstruct the lumbar spine or the bony pelvis from your CT of the abdomen and pelvis, and you do not need to perform separate dedicated studies of the lumbar spine or bony pelvis. Fluoroscopy requires ionizing radiation for image generation. The radiation dose associated with fluoroscopy is highly variable. It depends on where you're imaging, how much radiation you're requiring to penetrate the patient, and how long you keep the radiation on or how long the procedure takes. Doses can be lower than one milligray or greater than 100 milligray. Interventional procedures that require fluoroscopy to perform typically have the highest dose. So ERCP, evaluating the bile ducts or the pancreatic ducts, angiography, evaluating for bleeds or evaluating the heart, or embolization procedures are examples of high dose fluoroscopic studies. Fluoroscopy is rarely indicated in pregnancy and should be avoided if possible. What is the best initial imaging modality for evaluating a pregnant patient with right upper quadrant pain, leukocytosis, and hyperbilirubinemia? Ultrasound is the preferred first line imaging modality for many different pathologic processes in pregnant women. In this case, someone with right upper quadrant pain, leukocytosis, and hyperbilirubinemia, we would be thinking of acute cholecystitis or cholangitis or cholecolithiasis, and therefore ultrasound can help us look for gallstones, an inflamed gallbladder, or a dilated common bile duct. Nuclear scintigraphy is another form of diagnostic imaging that uses ionizing radiation. Unlike fluoroscopy, CT, and radiographs, where the ionizing radiation is generated externally and passed through the patient, with nuclear scintigraphy, you administer a radiopharmaceutical that goes into the body, localizes to a specific part of the body, and then sends out ionizing radiation, which is used to form the image. Nuclear scintigraphy is rarely indicated in pregnancy. In the past, VQ scans and PE protocols were of similar dose, but now with new techniques, CT for suspected PE has a much lower dose than a VQ scan and is felt to be safer in pregnancy than a VQ scan. Iodine-131, which is a very powerful radiopharmaceutical typically used for thyroid ablation or to treat thyroid cancer, is rarely, if ever, indicated in pregnancy as it can accumulate within the fetal thyroid and cause high fetal radiation exposure. Technetium 99M is the most common radiopharmaceutical used in a wide range of nuclear scintigraphy studies. It is generally felt to be safe in pregnancy if indicated, but almost always there is an alternative imaging modality that will provide good diagnostic sensitivity and specificity with lower fetal dose and therefore lower risk. PET-CT is another type of nuclear medicine exam where a radiopharmaceutical is administered to the patient and accumulates within the body and then generates ionizing radiation for image creation. PET-CT is felt to be a moderate risk because the PET tracer often accumulates in the bladder and can cause high fetal dose. Note that if you do have a pregnant patient who accidentally gets a PET CT or needs a PET CT, the radiation dose is not high enough that it would warrant termination of the pregnancy. This example is of a pregnant woman who is getting follow-up for lymphoma, had an unknown pregnancy, and received a PET CT. In this case, the fetus was very early in development, 
and the pregnancy was carried to term, and at this point, no adverse effects have come from the PET-CT in this patient. If a patient does have a PET-CT and is found to be pregnant, you might consider dose calculation using a medical physicist and counsel the patient about the theoretical risks associated with a PET-CT. What is the best initial imaging modality for evaluating a pregnant patient with acute shortness of breath? A radiograph is probably the best initial modality. Radiograph is of minimal risk with low fetal dose and may help you detect a pleural effusion or a pneumonia or atelectasis. If a radiograph does not provide you with the answer or if you have a high suspicion of pulmonary embolism, a CT could be obtained after the radiograph. What is the best imaging modality for evaluation of a pregnant woman presenting as an unrestrained driver intubated in the field due to altered mental status? Again, we will obtain a radiograph initially of the chest, but then CT will almost certainly be performed. And in for this indication, the risks of life-threatening injury from trauma outweigh the risks of fetal dose exposure and therefore a CT can be performed. In summary, women of reproductive age should be screened for pregnancy prior to obtaining diagnostic imaging. If a woman is found to be pregnant, informed consent should be obtained and the informed consent process should be used as a time to reassure the patient and discuss the real but minimal risks of radiation. If a patient is found to be pregnant, MRI or ultrasound should be used whenever possible as they do not require ionizing radiation. If you do require a diagnostic imaging modality that uses ionizing radiation, as long as that ionizing radiation is going to be applied outside of the abdomen or pelvis, there's minimal risk to the fetus. In patients with suspected pulmonary embolus, a CT PE protocol is preferred over a VQ scan. CT of the abdomen and pelvis is felt to be an acceptable risk in the setting of trauma. CTs of the lumbar spine, the bony pelvis, CTs of the abdomen and pelvis when non-emergent, fluoroscopy, nuclear scintigraphy, and PET-CT are rarely indicated and alternative modalities should be used if possible. Thank you for your time.